All right. We've got a few minutes after six o'clock. I think we will go ahead and get started. Want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions tonight. All right. The first thing I want to do is to let you know that I'm joined tonight by the Department of Fish and Wildlife's director, Kelly Suswind, and my regional management team. But I'd like to start first with Kelly. Kelly, it's good to see you. Good to see you too, Steve. Thanks for having me on tonight. Uh, excited about tonight. As you said, this is a continuation of our efforts to get out into each region and, and be able to really interact directly with the public that we serve. Started it a few years ago. Uh, started obviously in a face-to-face -face live <laughs> version and uh, we will get back to that someday, but we're not quite there yet, but look forward to when we do. These really are about an opportunity to connect directly with you folks out there. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. And tonight I'm pretty excited. We have the regional management team with us. So these are the leads for within the agency. We are broken into programs, wildlife, fish, habitat, enforcement. And we have a regional lead in each of our six regions. And, and those folks are all here tonight. And I think it's a great opportunity for you here in region one to, to see the people who are really the the movers and shakers in the region and how we implement everything that we do at DFW. So excited to get them involved in tonight's show and I'll, uh, I'll kick it back to Steve. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Um, first, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that we're recording this event and we will post it online afterwards for those that are unable to attend. Um, we're going to start tonight with a few updates on topics from around the department as well as from this region specifically. Um, but we do want to commit half of our time tonight to questions and answers. Um, to help us with that, I'd like to give my regional management team members a chance to introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Robinette. I'm the Regional Wildlife Program Manager here in Spokane. Our wildlife program uh, is made up of several different uh, sub-programs. Uh, we have our district wildlife biologists who do wildlife population surveys. They manage game species by setting hunting seasons. They're also responsible for endangered species recovery and for managing other non-game species. Uh, we also have the wildlife conflict specialists within the program. They're responsible for working with landowners on deer and elk damage, as well as wolf and livestock conflict. We have another group of biologists who do private lands work, specifically ma mainly with far the farming community, working on hunting access programs and habitat development projects. And then finally, wildlife area management occurs in the wildlife program. So those are the folks that manage our wildlife areas and our water access sites. Thanks, Kevin. Looks like you might still be, there you go, Mark. All right, sorry, had a little trouble with the mute button. Hi, I'm Mark Wachtel, I'm the Habitat Program Manager for Region 1. Uh, we do all sorts of things in the region. We do uh, permitting in for construction projects in state waters uh, via the hydraulic code. Uh, we provide technical ins, uh, assistance to local governments for implementing the Growth Management Act and the Shoreline Management Act. Uh, we work on major projects, so big energy projects. Uh, we'll provide a technical assistance for that. And we work in the forest environment. Uh, we work a lot with the U.S. Forest Service, and we also work with DNR uh, to implement the forest practices. Thanks, Mark. Hi, I'm um, Mike Sprecher. I'm a captain with the enforcement program or the department's enforcement program. And currently I oversee the oper enforcement operations in uh, region one. Um, and uh, the enforcement program, I guess our mission is to protect the natural resources of the state and the public we serve. And we do that through assurance of compliance with the rules and regulations that are put in place. Thanks, Mike. Good evening. I'm Chris Donley. I'm the regional program manager for the fish program here in region one. Uh, we're divided into three sections, fish management, hatcheries, and fish science. Uh, fish management is generally responsible for developing rules and monitoring fish, uh, fish populations around uh, the, the region and developing those rule sets uh, based on conservation as well as opportunity. 
fish hatcheries obviously generate most of the fish that we see that are of salmonid in nature, so both trout and salmon in region one. And fish science is responsible for a tremendous amount of monitoring and evaluation both of wild and hatchery stocks of fish. Uh, for this region, it's mostly in the anadromous zone, which is in the snake basin and tributaries. Thank I'm you, Chris. Chief. I'm in the lands division of the wildlife program. Uh, the lands division provides resources for the region and works with regional staff to manage more than a million acres of land in Washington. Uh, that includes 113,600 acres here in region one. We provide specialists in forest thinning, prescribed fire, property rights, uh, cultural resources, water rights, and vegetation management. And we also work with regional staff to write permits and documents for commercial and recreational uses of WDFW's land. All right, back to you, Steve. Excellent. Thanks, Jared. Well, I really appreciate that from all of you. And I know that we will be hearing from all of you as the questions start rolling in later tonight. So uh, don't go far away. All right, um, if I could have the, uh, the first slide. All right, thank you. All right, so I'd like to start with a quick overview of the department's regional structure. Um, WDFW is organized into six regions, and specific to the eastern region, or region one, if I go north to south, the counties are Ferry, Stevens, and Pend Oreille, and then Lincoln, Spokane, and Whitman, followed by Walla Walla, Columbia, Garfield, and Asotin. Um, our headquarters, as a number of you probably know, I think that would be the next slide. Uh, is in uh, actually in Spokane Valley. And we have field or district offices in Colville, Dayton, Clarkston, and Walla Walla. And I just wanna remind people that uh, please feel free to reach out to our customer service staff. We've got a great group of customer service um, staff here in region one, actually uh, from, uh, from around the agency. Um, but you can always contact us uh, at our phone number, 509-892-1001. And you can reach us by email at teamspokane, all one word, at dfw.wa.gov. Now I know that's in the chat, but I know that we might have some folks on the phone. So we wanted to make sure we got those out to you. All right, with that, um, I'd like to pass it back to Director Susuin for a couple of updates. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and I'll try to, uh, I'll go through these fairly quickly. Usually when I make it to the regions, folks want to know the, the hot stuff going on at, at headquarters. For us right now, we're coming into a legislative session. January 10th is the beginning of the next session. It's a short session. We alternate between long and short sessions. Uh, the short session is a 60-day session, and we call it the sprint uh, for good reason. It's really hectic, and things are flying quick. It's really an update on budgets, typically, and minor issues that uh, basically no room for a lot of big new issues. So we're going in pretty light this year. These are our 2022 legislative priorities on this on this slide. I'll run through them fairly quickly. The first one is making hunting and fishing more accessible. This is a, a really an accumulation of several small, I'll call them housekeeping type items that help us uh, do just what the, the bullet says, make uh, hunting and fishing more accessible. These are things like our youth, aligning our youth age. Right now we're at 15 and 16 for hunting and fishing. This would make them both 16. We have things in here like having a, a temporary license be used for our Lowland Lake opener. So it makes it a little easier, more accessible. That's our biggest event of the year. We want more folks out there, uh, get them exposed to it and hopefully get them hooked on fishing, pun intended. We also have uh, some advantages for college students in this one. So if you're a, a college student from outside the state, but you're a full-time resident student, you can get resident licenses. It also makes the same type of a, a, a issue available for our military. So, and then lastly, I, this also offers a, we would offer a $20 coupon for your first hunting license at, after you fish hunter, hunter education. So a bunch of little good things that we're trying to roll up into one package so we can get through the legislature. We, we have a, a I don't think most folks realize just how much of our stuff is controlled by statute and all the things I just mentioned would require legislative approval in order to do them. So we're, we're gonna move forward on that. 
Our second one is really pretty simple. This is our Americans with Disability Advisory Committee. That's specified in statute as well, who can be uh, eligible to be a participant on that. And uh, we're gonna try to open that up to basically anybody with an ADA type disability would be eligible. We wanna add a couple of seats to that advisory committee as well for those that assist and support disabled hunters, fishers, and other outdoor recreationists. Uh, those folks that are really helping those the disabled get out there are have a lot of great ideas and we wanna make sure that they're part of this group too. The, last, the next one is increasing access to state recreation lands. This one's pretty straightforward. Right now, to get onto state lands, you need a Discover Pass. And the Discover Pass are really run by the Department of Parks, Parks and Rec, and they, uh, they are allowed to give 12 free days in the year where you don't need a Discover Pass. That's a great thing, I think. I think it's not so great that it only applies on parks. It doesn't apply in DFW land or DNR land. So we want to uh, increase that free day to our lands. And we also want to have the opportunity to sound with park, sit down with parks and try to pick some days that are really more aligned to our customer base, our outdoor recreationists using our, our lands for hunting, fishing, you know, any other any other outdoor recreation, birding, wildlife watching. But we, we would like to have some control on the days to make it uh, most valuable to our, our constituents. The last is increasing electronic uh, licensing, print from home licensing. Uh, I feel like a Luddite that we even have to be asking for this or that we aren't there yet, but we recognize the desire for this amongst our constituents. Uh, much easier for folks, much more convenient. It's good for us too. It's cheaper to do business this way. And it's also gives us better real-time data. So we're pretty excited about getting there. Uh, surrounding states are, are ahead of us on this one. So we're gonna do our best to learn from them and move on. I think we're ready to roll. Uh, we just need that legislative approval to do it. Next slide. Next slide is on our, our budget. I'll go through the budget requests. These are partial budget requests. I should, should say that all of the legislative requests and the budget requests are available online. Uh, we have the uh, links posted in the chat for you. And uh, if you have questions that I don't get to or on anything tonight, you can also send us an email uh, at, at the location identified in the chat and we'll get, you back, get back to you on these. So I think the good news, the really good news about this, before I bore you with a whole bunch of detail on budget, is the governor's budget came out today. It's uh, very generous for DFW, especially in a supplemental year where we where usually don't see a lot of money available. Last couple of uh, revenue forecasts have been good, so there's a little more money available, and the governor's uh, budget treats us well. And I believe everything on this slide, which in the other town halls I've been saying we are asking for, has made it into the governor's budget. Now that's the first step. That's the governor's budget goes to the, the legislature. They have a house budget and they have a Senate budget and then they have a conference budget. So we're, we're in the first steps of this race, but uh, it's a huge deal to get it in that first step because it's really hard to slip it in there later. So we're really happy that all these, I think are in the governor's budget. The first one's uh, $2.6 million for freshwater monitoring. This supports our fisheries around the state. Uh, more and more scrutiny on our fisheries with ESA, also with challenged runs, also with our co-management uh, responsibilities to our, our tribal co-managers. This is uh, just bolstering that monitoring program. We're, we're getting to an era where for us to fish, we need to really have a, an extensive monitoring program so we know exactly what we're doing to the resource. This, this would support us moving towards that. The second one is about improving wildlife monitoring. It says here particularly about mountain goats, but this includes deer, elk, mountain goat, bighorn sheep, and even some turkey. So uh, this is partly to make up for some one-time dollars we got before where we've got money to put collars out on animals. Those collars wear out. We have to replace collars at our captured animals to do it. Uh, so this is an ask for us to get back up to date and hopefully have some ongoing funds to stay ahead of the curve on that. Salmon Recovery and Growth Management Act. So under the Growth Management Act, local, local jurisdictions, cities and counties have to have their growth management plan. They have to update on a periodic basis. That's really critical for us to get in there. Department of Fish and Wildlife is the science resource expert for these local jurisdictions on what it takes to protect fish and wildlife, particularly around salmon. As we put more and more people on the landscape, we got to get better at it. Having the rules set up straight and that beginning in that Growth Management Act is crucial. So we're asking money to make sure that we can provide the service to cities and counties. Building the salmon team is just what it sounds like. Uh, more and more uh, scrutiny on the salmon fishing. 
more and more challenging for us as it gets more technical. We uh, negotiate with tribes through our North of Falcon for coastal and Puget Sound. We also include uh, Columbia River on that. We have individual tribes that have as many technical staff as we have at DFW, and there's 20 some tribes. And so this is really to get us uh, staffed up and able to make sure that we hold up our end of that bargain and, and represent our constituents well. Forage fish spawning, this is uh, primarily on the West Coast, but herring, sand lance, anchovies, et cetera. This is something we monitor for a long time. It's that first step, that base step in the whole food chain that supports our recreational fisheries. We've had this monitoring going on for years. It got moved into another budget, at another agency, and then somehow disappeared. So we're trying to get it back to make sure we can continue that long-term database. Uh, hatchery production, this is really a cost of living kind of thing. We're having to, we have to, we have to mark our, our salmonids in particular. We mark probably more fish than anybody in the world, marking being clipping that adipose fan. That's getting more expensive. It's getting harder with COVID especially. So this is to add some money to that. And then also just to pay the bills at some of the hatcheries for like discharge permits and things like that where costs have gone up. Supporting safe and sanitary. I'm getting to the end here. I know this is boring, but if I don't do it, folks, will ask me later. So uh, safe and sanitary water access areas. Uh, you heard earlier, we've got uh, in the wildlife areas, we've got 33 wildlife areas and over 500 water access sites. This is on the water access site. Last year, we had about 32 million visitors to our lands at DFW, which is wonderful. That's what we want. We want folks out there enjoying that, recreating. Uh, but with that influx of people came an increase in trash and vandalism and all the, uh, the unfortunate things that come along. So this is some money for us to get out there and get caught back up to make sure when you go out to enjoy our lands that it's a safe uh, and pleasant experience for everybody. The last is fish passage rulemaking. Uh, this was a, a, a passed a couple of years ago. It was a bill that passed a couple of years ago, sorry. Uh, and this is to actually do the rulemaking to implement that bill. It's really around fish screening primarily to make sure that we're uh, keeping those fish in the river where they want and keeping them out of the, those, the channels where we don't want them. Uh, so we're updating the rules. It's another one of those baseline things you have to have in place if we're gonna do our, our basic work to, to support the populations as a whole. So, so that's it for my blast from headquarters. Uh, sorry about that. I'll, I'll touch a little bit now on a local F issue that uh, I just wanna acknowledge is causing, caused some pain for folks and that's our Snake River Steelhead run this year. 2021 run in the Columbia River was the worst recorded, single worst recorded return we've had on the interior summer steelhead. And uh, since we've been taking record and the record started in 1938. So really uh, the bottom of the bottom run here, we're at about just shy of 70,000 fish passing Bonneville, uh, about 40,000 over lower granite, about a quarter to a third of those are wild. So it's those wild fish we really need to be careful and protect. Don't have a lot of bright spots, but I gotta tell you our staff are out there the folks you're gonna be talking to tonight are working their tails off to try to provide some opportunity. Their first obligation is to protect the run, preserve, protect, perpetuate those runs, but man, they're, they're adamant about eking out some level of opportunity if they can do it. We had a, some surplus hatchery fish for the numbers I gave you, you can tell there were uh, a lot of hat, not a lot, but relative to wild hatchery fish available. So our staff are looking for areas, where can we get after those hatchery fish? Uh, keep those numbers down, keep the strays down, uh, but not impact the wilds. So even on a catch and release, you have a mortality on those wilds. And when you have a bad run like this, every mortality counts. So uh, staff did their best. I wanna, I wanna first congratulate staff because they really did eke out what they could. But at the same time, I wanna recognize that uh, we weren't able to provide opportunity to a lot of people. Uh, particularly around those smaller creeks where we had small runs coming back, uh, runs back to Soton Creek, Walla, the Walla Walla River, Tucci and Tucannon Rivers, really limited our ability to offer fisheries. And so a lot of folks just didn't get an opportunity to get out there. Uh, I'm hopeful, but boy, this, this is one of the biggest things that keeps me awake at night is the, the future of those steelhead in the Snake Basin with climate change, with our hydropower system, with uh, predation, both avian and pinniped. We, we just got a lot working against us. We need some good ocean conditions. 
we are committed to it. I think the governor's part of the reason the governor's budget was so generous to fish and wildlife is he's got a major effort around salmon and salmonids, including steelhead. So, uh, and I think I think our, our society is ready to recognize that we're, we're getting to a, a ragged edge where we're gonna have to do something different. So I'm, I'm gonna stay optimistic, uh, cautiously optimistic that we will get back to a healthy and abundant run of steelhead, but it's gonna take a lot of work. And I just wanna, I wanna acknowledge those folks that uh, feel like they missed out this year. We recognize you did, and, and we're, we're, we're doing our best to help get that turned around for you. With that, I think you've heard enough from the, the talking head from headquarters. Let's get to some regional stuff, Steve. All right, thanks Kelly, appreciate that. All right, so um, I wanted to touch on uh, four specific areas within the wildlife program uh, that I felt were probably most relevant and on people's minds, not that there won't be others. And that's why we've got uh, all of the various disciplines here tonight. But um, let's start with wolf recovery and management. Um, so if I could have the next slide. All right, thank you. Uh, so since 2008, Washington's wolf population has grown by an average of 26% per year. We do not yet have wolf population information for 2021 since that work is underway. So a recap for 2020. The state's minimum year-end wolf population increased by 22% and marked the 12th consecutive year of population growth. As of last December, December 2020, WDFW and the Colville tribes documented a minimum of 178 individuals in 29 packs and 13 successful breeding pairs, not including Colville tribe breeding pairs because they were not surveyed on the reservation. Because this is a minimum count, the actual number of wolves in Washington is likely higher and we certainly expect to see growth again this year. For the 2021 capture and monitoring season, we are currently monitoring 25 wolves in 17 packs, 16 wolves in 12 packs within region one. We were able to collar 14 wolves in 2021 and nine of those newly collared wolves are currently in region one in seven different packs. In regard to the 2021 grazing season, this past summer and fall, wolf livestock conflict occurred in several areas of the state, most notably in Ferry, Stevens, Columbia, Kittitas, and Okanagan counties. The department documented 17 total incidents of wolves depredating on livestock. And while impactful to affected producers, this is the fewest documented depredations since 2017. The director authorized lethal removal due to depredations in two pack territories, the Togo pack and the Columbia pack territory, with two wolves being lethally removed in the Columbia pack territory. This was the fewest wolf removals since 2015. In September of 2020, Governor Jay Inslee directed WDFW to initiate rulemaking related to wolf management with the goal of instituting practices that avoid the repeated loss of wolves and livestock in Washington. Per this direction, WDFW initiated rulemaking and provided a briefing to the Wolf Committee of the Fish and Wildlife Commission on December 2nd. More information and supporting documents about this rule can be found on the department's website. If I could have the next slide. All right, let's talk a little bit about the predator prey project. Some of you may be familiar with uh, it and includes a study area here in region one. Next slide, please. All right, so the Washington predator prey project is a five year research effort that began in the winter of 2016 2017 to investigate the effects of wolves and their competitors on ungulate populations in managed landscapes. It's a cooperative project with professors and graduate students from the University of Washington. Here in region one, the study is being conducted in GMUs 117 and 121, where the impact to ungulates, mule deer, white-tailed deer and elk, from wolves and from other large and small carnivores, carnivores such as cougars, bobcats and coyotes is being investigated. In 2021, field work has been completed and analysis is underway. We expect that WDFW and the university students will begin sharing results in 2022. Here is a quick 
breakdown on ungulate and carnivore captures. For white-tailed deer, captured and collared a total of 131 adult females over four winters. For elk, there was 63 adult females were captured and collared over the course of three winters. For mule deer, we captured and collared a total of 149 adult females over four winters. And now on the carnivore side of things, to date, 17 wolves representing five packs have been captured and collared in the lookout and loop loop packs in Okanagan and in Carpenter Ridge, Dirty Shirt, and Stranger Packs here in Northeast Region 1. On the cougar front, between December 1st of 2016 and November 30th of 2020, 34 adult and subadult cougars were captured in the Northeast study area, and 26 adult and subadult cougars were captured in the Okanagan study area. Lastly, camera grids as a part of the project Grids consisting of 50 to 60 cameras have been maintained in each study area since 2018. To date, 355 locations have been surveyed since that time, producing more than 2 million images of wildlife. If I could have the next slide. Let's talk a little bit about the Blue Mountains elk assessment. And next slide, please. All right, the Blue Mountains elk population has been below management objectives since 2017. The department has reduced antlerless harvest to maximize survival. Habitat, nutrition, and depressed recruitment are potential limiting factors on this population. Recruitment ratios since 2017 are not at levels that support stability or growth, and elk are in decline in some of the Blue Mountain GMUs. Documented calf survival is exceptionally low, 11% um, at 150 days. Um, so that's 11% of the originally collared elk calves are currently alive after only 150 days since collaring. The normal published range for annual survival, the time in which those elk calves would make it to their first birthday, um, ranges from 17% to 57%. So we're looking at an annual survival that will likely be less than 10% uh, when completed. A technical team composed of wildlife managers and scientists from the wildlife program began work on an elk assessment document in August of 2020 to help frame this problem. The assessment was presented to the Wildlife Committee of the Fish and Wildlife Commission on December 2nd and is available to the public at the commission's website. In addition, the department began an elk calf monitoring effort this spring which was May of 2021, to try to determine what might be going on with elk calves. We captured and collared 125 calves. There were two direct capture mortalities and seven dropped collars. But as of November 29th, 11 calves are still alive. Survival to 150 days is estimated at 11%. There have been 105 documented calf mortalities. 15 of those are unknown. Five were associated with infection, two starvations, four yet to be determined, and two died from what is known as exertional myopathy. 77 mortalities are attributed to predation, with at least 70% of those predation events coming from cougar. Next steps. The technical team will finalize the elk assessment document to include additional analyses and management recommendations. Um, approximately March of 2022. Um, the public and the Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, will be provided that final assessment and having given the opportunity for review. Uh, and if approved, management recommendations could be implemented in the fall of 2022. All right, if I could have the last slide here, we're in the home stretch, but uh, didn't think we could not discuss uh, this year's status of uh, disease that uh, affected Eastern Washington, a uh, broader geographic area than just region one. Uh, but we're gonna talk about epizootic hemorrhagic disease, blue tongue and chronic wasting disease. Eastern Washington was hit with a significant EHD blue tongue outbreak this summer and fall. And since mid August, WDFW biologists across Eastern Washington have responded to 100 re reports of dead and or dying deer with symptoms of blue tongue and or EHD. Well, what are these diseases? 
Epizootic hemorrhagic disease, or EHD, and blue tongue are common viral diseases that mostly affect white-tailed deer. This year, we also saw bighorn sheep and mule deer die from this virus. Deer with hemorrhagic disease may be lethargic, disoriented, or unresponsive to the presence of humans. They may salivate excessively, foam at the mouth, bleed from the nose, and have swollen, blue-tinged tongues. Currently, there is no treatment for EHD or blue tongue. EHD and blue tongue occur during hot, dry periods. Animals seeking water visit wet, muddy areas where Culicoides gnats, known as midges, transmit the viruses by biting. The spread of these diseases is usually cut short by cooler, wetter weather, as water covers mud flats and freezing temperatures kill off uh, gnats. Humans are not affected by either EHD or blue tongue. However, we always recommend that you avoid shooting and consuming animals that are obviously sick. WDFW did not reduce white-tailed deer seasons this fall because all antlerless general seasons have already been removed and antlerless permits were greatly reduced prior to this outbreak as a result of the 2015 blue tongue outbreak. Given this year's hemorrhagic disease, we anticipate that these reductions will be in place for several years. Finally, I wanna to touch on another disease. EHD and blue tongue are completely separate from chronic wasting disease. Chronic wasting disease is a fatal disease caused by a malformed protein called a prion, and that can spread through direct contact between deer or through food sources or the environment. Animals with CWD in the terminal phase may have excessive weight loss, appear uncoordinated and lethargic, salivate excessively, drink more water than usual, and eventually die. Since late August this year, WDFW staff in Northeast Washington have been collecting samples from roadkill deer and then hunter harvested deer to test for CWD, with a total of 389 samples so far. At this point, all results have been negative for CWD and opportunistic sampling and testing will continue into the new year, mostly from road kills. Two cases of CWD were recently confirmed in Western Idaho. Prior to that, the closest known case of CWD had been near Libby, Montana. In light of these Idaho cases, staff will be evaluating how to most effectively conduct surveillance for the disease during next year's hunting seasons. As with blue tongue and EHD, there is no scientific evidence that CWD is transmitted from animals to humans, but hunters are strongly advised to avoid consuming animals that are obviously sick. And the Center for Disease Control states that you should not eat meat from an animal that has tested positive for CWD. All right, um, that wraps up our presentations. Um, we're excited to open it up to questions. Um, I will make sure that we honor our 50% of our time to our questions. And so um, we will be looking at uh, wrapping up uh, approximately five minutes or so uh, after seven o'clock. At any time, type in your question or comment in the question and answer feature on your screen. If you could keep your question brief, um, please be respectful. I know that you will and submit one at a time so that we can allow as many people to participate as possible. If you're participating by phone, and I know we've probably got folks out there, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine, and then to unmute yourself when it's your turn, you can dial star six. We're gonna answer as many questions as we can, and again, you just heard me to, to commit to making sure that we had half of this meeting uh, be devoted to questions. Um, if we don't get to your question, you can email us at director at dfw.wa.gov. Um, Kelly's got lots of spare time and he's gonna answer all your questions for you. All right, let's see. I am going to locate my first question and then uh, I'm gonna uh, direct that question to I think the, the best person to answer. All right, so first question looks like it's gonna be for Kevin uh, in terms of Blue Mountain elk herd, what percent of calf mortality is attributed to wolf predation? Yeah, that's a low number. And if I'm remembering the results of the, um, of the initial results of the work done over the summer out of the, the number of, of 
uh, dead calves that you indicated, there were three that were attributed to wolves. So that's okay. not a percentage, but I, I just I don't know how to calculate it. From. Yep. All right. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Uh, looks like we're going to stick with the Blue Mountain theme on our next question. So, Kevin, you're still up. Uh, what actions are being considered to improve the Blue Mountain elk recruitment? Yeah, I think um, Kyle, one of our uh, uh, our elk section manager, got that question from the commission. So um, there are the things that could happen um, could be status quo where we wouldn't do anything, or some of the other things that we would be considering would be some sort of predator management. Okay. All right. Let's see. Our next one asks about uh, staying with wildlife theme. I think Kevin, you're still up. Um, person would like to know how the conservation effort for pygmy rabbits is coming along. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's region two and not region one. And so I'm not really tracking that. That's in the Columbia Basin over in uh, Grant County. If anyone else, any other panelists know the answer to that, uh, jump on in. Okay, thanks, Kevin. And sorry, I also, I, I was looking at, I've got a couple of different places to look here. And so I'm gonna go back and make sure I uh, got some other ones from our chat here. Um, all right, next question. Why do some of your lands close in winter? People who buy hunting licenses and discover passes aren't getting their money's worth. That's gonna be another Kevin question. Sure. Um, Good question. Um, so that is all about protecting wintering wildlife. And so um, we try to only close uh, areas where we've got sensitive wildlife like big game that are especially vulnerable during the winter. And our in, under, the reason why the department owns lands is so that we can provide wildlife habitat and then secondarily to provide wildlife related recreation. And so those areas that you see that are closed are closed to protect those wintering animals. And then there's a second reason in, in places where there are ag communities adjacent to our lands, we're trying to keep the big game on the wildlife area and off of those, um, those winter crops. All right, thank you, Kevin. All right, we are gonna change it up here a little bit. Uh, Chris, looks like you're up. This person would like to know, uh, maybe this is a tag team with Kelly. Um, how will WDFW hold dam operators accountable, specifically for the lower four Snake River dams for anadromous fish impacts? With low wild fish runs, what mitigation plans will the dam operators provide in coordination with WDFW? Kelly, I'll take first swing at it and then you correct all the things I say are wrong. Um, so, so the dam operators themselves are the federal government. Um, unlike uh, public utilities that have a FERC license or federal, federal Energy Regulatory Commission license that authorizes operation of that facility, the um, dams on the Columbia River and Snake are in what's called the FCRPS, Federal Columbia Power System, that's uh, regulated under the Northwest Power Act, and therefore the authority for uh, mitigation goes all to Bonneville Power Administration. So. The folks that we hold responsible for mitigating for impacts from those uh, eight dams on the Snake and, and Mainstem Columbia are, is Bonneville. Bonneville has a, a really large mitigation plan. Um, I don't remember the specific amount, but it's somewhere between 150 and $200 million that are directed annually at, at mitigating for impacts of hydropower. Um, those impacts that are mitigated for include habitat work, um, which we do a considerable amount, and Mark Wachtel's on and could go into detail on that if you want him to, Steve. But we do habitat work in the two cannon system. Uh, we do habitat work with the co-managers in the Walla Walla Basin, Tushi, as, as well as the Soton Creek, um, and even in the Grand Ronde. So a lot of habitat work is occurring that would increase freshwater smolt survival and production. Um, and thus translate into more adults, hopefully, um, as well as mitigation is applied to hatchery fish. And a lot of folks would say, well, maybe hatchery fish are contrary to wild fish survival. But I would um, remind you that recreation is one of our mandates. Um, there are a tremendous number of people that still want to harvest and eat salmon and steelhead out of the Columbia Basin. And having those available lessens impacts on wild fish as well. So 
It's a complex system of how we keep folks accountable for their impacts. Um, it would be probably advisable if you wanted to go way into the weeds to look at the Northwest Power Act and the, the formation of the Northwest Power Council that really directs Bonneville in terms of how they spend those funds. Um, while it sounds like a lot of money to 150 to 200 million, also need to remember that there are a number of entities out there that gather those funds up and Washington is only one of those. So um, we do the best with the money that's afforded to us to, to ensure that we're putting protections in place that both enhance existing populations and protect what we have. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, Kelly, anything to, to add? No way, he did a great job. <laughs> okay. All right, Chris, we're gonna stick with you on another fish question. Uh, and then it looks like we're gonna go back to a wildlife question. Um, this person is concerned about West Slope cutthroat in the Colville River, um, uh, both the main river and its tributaries, and also the drown brown trout population in the Colville River, indicating that that has dwindled drastically. Um, wants to know what we're doing to address those two issues. So West Slope cutthroat trout in the, um, in the West as a whole are considered a very important native species. Um, having said that, what makes the Colville River unique is that it was not a West Slope cutthroat stream historically. So those fish are of hatchery origin, and I think they're doing well in certain portions of the Colville River, um, but they're not the emphasis species from a native species recovery perspective. That would be red band rainbow trout, which uh, for the Colville River and the main stem Columbia above Grand Coulee was historically steelhead, and those fish that were captured above uh, when the blocked area went in place um, are now resident rainbow trout up there. And so we see, you know, thousands of those fish occur in, in multiple tributaries and in the main stem Columbia River. And so that's our emphasis species for the Colville. Having said that, um, habitat in the Colville is not in great shape. Um, we don't have any current activities going in there for habitat restoration. And we have some species composition issues that make it difficult to, to get uh, a good foothold for uh, for red bands in the main stem Colville, and to a lesser extent in the tributaries. We have some tributaries where they're doing pretty well. Um, so the species composition issues are that we have a number of non-native fishes in the main stem Colville that are suppressing um, red band trout production. And one of those is brown trout. Um, it's not to say that we're making a value judgment of, of, against brown trout, but there is an understanding, or we have an understanding that you know, the presence of brown trout is suppressing the overall abundance and diversity of red bands in, in the system. And so you, we're not actively suppressing brown trout in there, but I would remind um, the person that asked the question that we had a severe drought in 2015, um, and then again this year. And so fall spawners, which require inundation of habitat to, to effectively spawn in the fall when we have exceptionally low water, they have very limited places to spawn. Um, so that probably resulted in fairly small year class coming on from 15. So if we think about 2021, the bulk of our fish that we would see in the fishery are ages three to six. It really corresponds well with uh, that drought. And then we just took another double whammy on brown trout this summer. So um, I'm not telling you the future's bright for brown trout in the Colville River, at least until we get a few wet years. Um, I also don't think that there's any activity occurring there that would explain a long-term trend for extirpation of brown trout in the Colville River. They've been there historically for a very long time, and they're a somewhat popular fishery. Having said that, uh, the other part of this is because they are increasing in popularity on the Colville River, it could simply be increased exploitation is driving the overall number and size of, of brown trout down. And, Unfortunately, we do not have the money to run the kind of creel work that would allow us to understand that. And while the Colville River is important, uh, I think you saw what the director pointed out is we're still trying to catch up on freshwater monitoring in our salmon rivers. And so the Colville River is a, a few notches down in priority from that. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Kevin, looks like you're back up. Uh, this person would like to know what the plan is for controlling turkeys. They are out of control and destroying habitat of native bird species and destroying crops. Person would like to propose a year-round turkey tag. 
Yeah, turkeys are challenging. Um, so on the control side, if it's uh, if it's private land uh, conflict with turkeys, then we have wildlife conflict specialists. I think I mentioned that in my introduction, uh, who work directly with uh, producers or uh, occasionally with uh, residents and neighborhoods on on managing that uh, that problem. Um, if you turkey populations are robust in region one and have been for a while, and if you've kind of monitored this over the years, you've seen that we've liberalized turkey seasons just about every cycle to the point where they're um, about as liberal as we can get right now without going to a year round season. I think there's some fair chase things that might be associated with trying to go with a year, a year round turkey season. Um, but it is something the department is certainly aware of in region one and uh, looking at different opportunities to, to create more opportunity on that robust population. Thank you, Kevin. All right, next one, uh, let's see. Mike, Captain Sprecher, I'm gonna direct this one your way. You may not have some of the specifics, but, uh, but let's find out. Um, person would like to know when we could expect the cougar non-lethal pursuit only season to take effect and how many houndsmen would be permitted per region? Well, the last I was briefed on this was in uh, early summer, thinking it was gonna, something may come out before the end of summer, but I believe it's on hold and maybe I, I hate to defer to the director if he has more information on that, but currently that I, I would want to get back to that person with the status and where we're at, to be honest, unless the director has, some more information. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, excuse me, Mike, Captain Mike. Uh, a little bit more. We, we had to go through our rulemaking. That's been completed. Uh, then you have to put together a training program. So that's, that's what is the curriculum, what are the materials, et cetera. That's being done right now. I believe the scheduled time frame for that is uh, probably about February, February or March. I'm a little squishy on the time, but basically early in the new year, we'll have the training materials and curriculum put together and then start training uh, soon thereafter. I do not remember the number of specific houndsmen in each region or each, each segment. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to get in. Uh, uh, Becky Bennett, I don't remember her new name, she's been married, uh, is our lead on that and she'll get you back. She's fantastic about that. Great, thanks Kelly. I think she's now uh, Becky Elder, I believe. I think that's right, thank you, Steve. Sure. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, this one actually ties into the question on Turkey. Um, can the department work on more private land accessibility for Miriam's and Rio Grande turkey hunting, particularly in areas in region one where wild turkeys are becoming a nuisance? Yeah, we're actually, uh, we have a program in uh, Northeast uh, which combines trying to get additional access on private land, both for white-tailed deer hunting as well as turkey hunting. Um, and a lot of it has to do with landowner interests because um, many of our hunting programs, the landowners don't actually receive any money. Uh, they would just receive signage and additional enforcement uh, coverage. So there is a small program that uses deer and turkey tag money um, to actually pay some landowners. And so it's just a matter of finding landowners that are willing to get into our program, but it is something we're always looking for. Great, thanks, Kevin. All uh, right, Steve? yes. Steve, I have a live question. Um, so I'm going to unmute Bo and let him uh, ask a question. Bo, we're pretty tight on time. We have a lot of questions, so please limit it to one and I'm unmuting you now. Still okay, Hi. You how are you doing? Great, Bo, go ahead. Okay, I'm an outfitter in the Blue Mountains. It's kind of, funny and saddened that I don't have input here on your guys' hidden agenda in the Blue Mountains. Um, what are you guys doing, not only for the elk, that's kind of a redundant question at this point, but what are you doing for the mule deer? It All right. So Kevin, will you be able to speak to some of the mule deer work that has been done? Uh, and then any ideas about uh, mule deer moving forward relative to, to management actions? Yeah, um, I know we've 
we've had we did have the mule deer take uh, a hit with the um, the EHD outbreak, and I, this is probably not what Bo is wanting to hear, but we will probably be doing some reductions on antlerless permits for mule deer just to try to get that herd back on its feet. And then over the last three or four years, Bo, we've had a mule deer study where we've been collaring uh, does to try to figure out what's going on with that segment of the population. From a, uh, if you're thinking or talking strictly from a habitat perspective, um, you know, we're doing some control burning on some of our wildlife areas and, and that kind of work. Um, I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but those are some things that come to mind. Thanks, Kevin. All right, uh, looking at the list here, got another fish question for Chris. This person is interested in the Little Goose Spring Salmon Fishery. Uh, he remembers it being open Tuesdays and Fridays, which was inconvenient to people working full-time jobs. On top of that, the fishery was open for only a week or maybe two weeks, and then it was closed prematurely. As a result, they weren't able to experience that fishery in the spring. They're curious if there's any way or a plan to, that could be put in place by WDFW to both mitigate premature closure as well as potentially warn for these closures in advance? Yeah, that's a really fair question. So um, unfortunately, spring chinook are popular everywhere. Um, and what I mean by that is we can't produce enough of them to satisfy the demand for harvest. And then as they move up river, the number that are available for harvest ratchets down. And so I don't remember the specific number that were available for harvest in the spring of last year, but it was less than 400 fish that we were able to harvest in the Snake River. So on any given day, any section of river that we open in the Snake River, it adds up to about 100 fish harvested. And we have these small controlled little areas that will open either uh, directly below Ice Harbor Dam, um, below Little Goose, uh, or in the Clarkston area. And so when you know that we open it and it takes 100 fish each day you open it and we had 400 fish, that gives us about four days of fishing. Um, we play some games with that to try to spread it out. One of the things we do is we don't open it on a Saturday. Um, if we opened it on a Saturday, which I know would be convenient for folks, um, we'd have too many people and we'd have major conflicts in the small areas that we open. And what I mean by conflicts is just not enough places for people to fish. And so to try to eliminate that, um, we make it a little more difficult to access. And if it's really important to you, you're gonna have to take a day off work to do it. Um, that also allows us to maybe crunch that harvest from 100 fish a day to 80 fish a day. Whereas if we opened it on a Saturday, it could balloon up to as much as 125 or 150 fish a day. So um, none of these answers I think are salve and are really feel good to folks that are trying to make a living and just have a Saturday off. Um, really the answer is for us to get more fish. Um, that's what we're working on all the time. If we have 800 or 1,000 fish in our catch quota for the Snake River, then we will offer weekend days for fisheries because we have enough room in that, in that um, allotment of fish to be able to afford a few big days on the weekends um, in the harvest. So a, a little bit of advice to this individual is if you see less than 800 or 1,000 fish in the catch quota for the snake, you can anticipate we're not likely to offer a weekend fishery. The other piece of advice I would offer is if you know that the math works out to 100 fish a day and we have 500 fish, you know you have five different openers in which to attend. So take advantage of that very small window. Why don't we advertise better that we're going to close? Uh, the reason is, is because we're literally adding one fish after another until we get exactly to the catch allotment. And so, um, we don't want to have this fits and starts open and close as we do the math. So we spread our days out, uh, Tuesday and Friday, Wednesday, Sunday, pick the days um, so that we can do the math in between and close when we hit the allotted amount that's allocated to us. 
And I appreciate the frustration. I really wish we could just open it for a week and tell people to go get them. But if we did that, we would so far exceed our catch allocation that we'd be in trouble with managers both up and downstream of us. Um, I, I don't have a better explanation than that for it, Steve. That, and, and if it doesn't make sense, tell me to keep going here. Nope, I think uh, I think we're good there. And and uh, this person uh, he now now knows who they might contact to get additional information. Uh, and so Chris is going to be available. Um, uh, and and uh, happy yeah, to give me a fair discussion. warning when you're calling me that you're the guy that's already frustrated with me when I answer the phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, we're in, uh, I want to make sure that we move through as many more questions as possible. And again, we're going to go with, until approximately 710. So um, uh, let's see, next question. Have there been any talks, looks like Kevin, you're up. Have there been any talks within the department um, or with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to reintroduce woodland caribou to the Selkirk eco ecosystem? Yeah, good question. Um, so where we're at with caribou recovery, and then, and as you might imagine, that's an international air effort. And so we need to get the population in Canada back on its feet and stable enough um, to actually have a donor population to move uh, caribou back down into the lower 48. So all of the efforts by the international caribou recovery community are on the Canadian side. So no talks about that. That'd be a, a fair ways off. All right, thanks, Kevin. Um, Kelly, I think I might uh, serve this one to you from the standpoint of maybe policy discussions that have occurred within Olympia leading up to, to budget packages being developed. Um, this person says they, they didn't see anything in the budget for wolf management um, or for ungulate counts and recovery. Now, I know that we did talk about game species monitoring, so you might loop back on that one, but anything else about wolf management funding uh, or ungulate recovery dollars? Yeah, so I, I apologize. I should have been more clear about what I was talking about. So, so we've, we've got on a biennial basis about a $500 million budget. Uh, and then each, each budget cycle, either, whether it's biennial or annual, we have a carry forward, which is basically, you know, call, called our baseline, our base funding carry forward. What I was describing is ask for new dollars for this year in that list. And so uh, we've done pretty well for on the wolf side and ungulate side, especially the wolf side. Uh, you, you can thank your local legislators here in region one. They've done a great job of, of promoting money through the legislature for that. And that's part of our already existing funding. So we didn't need to ask for that again. So, so don't, don't be worried that we're not going to have the money to do that, but we didn't have to ask for new money to do it. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. All right. This one is a uh, boy, this one's going to be an easy one, Kelly. Uh, what, what support, if any, um, would leadership, including the director, be willing to provide for a citizen led initiative to transfer power of Fish and Wildlife Commission appointments from the governor to the citizens via an election um, where the citizens would choose a representative from each geographic region. If WDFW is not willing to support this, could you explain why? Thanks, Steve. <laughs> uh, you know what, I, I actually like these questions. We're here for the hard questions. If we only ask, answer the easy questions, we'd be wasting everybody's time. So, so thanks for these questions. I, I'm gonna give you an honest answer. Uh, I, I don't know that I would support that. So I'm starting to hear lately, as you know, we're, we have some level of uh, dysfunction amongst our commission. I don't think that's a, a surprise to anybody. And so people are coming up with ideas on how to fix it. This is the, I think the first I've heard of this one. Uh, and it's odd because usually the complaints come in that it's become too politicized, but then I look at an election and what what are the citizens voting on? So I think what we need is, is and I've worked, I worked, had a call with the governor's office today to, to explain that I, I really don't care the affiliation of potential commissioners. I hear it should be all hunters and fishers. I frankly don't agree with that. Some of our strongest proponents for hunting and fishing on the commission don't hunt or fish themselves. And they're incredible advocates for, for those consumptive uh, activities. Uh, I, even that word gets people riled up. 
What we need is smart, open-minded people that will put the resource first and try to make sure that we have a good functioning commission and agency. Give me that and I could care less their affiliation or their background. They want them, if they're there with an open mind and they put the resource first, we will do well. We've got a fabulous staff. I think we defend and we rash, we we go through a lot of work to come up with our recommendations. I think they're solid. I think that open-minded person will be convinced by our arguments, by our great staff. And if they're not, we better pause and say, hey, here's a smart, open-minded person that's not quite agreeing with us. What's that mean? I think that's the healthy answer. How we get those folks, if it's whether it's through a governor appointee or some other process, uh, I don't know. But a general election to avoid some of the political concerns just seems like at odds to me. That's my honest answer. Uh, but but there is there is talk. There's no formal talk that I'm aware of, but there's a lot of talk going around. What's, what's the best structure for fish and wildlife? I do believe there's one of them is, should we just be a, a cabinet agency? Uh, I've told folks I don't support that either. I think the Fish and Wildlife Commission is the right structure. I think it could provide the right buffer from gubernatorial politics and other politics. It just needs to be implemented in a fair and consistent manner and we'll, we'll be fine. Great, thanks, thanks Kelly. Um, and, and thanks for not, not dodging the hard questions. Um, apologize for the lights going off here. I'm at the office and uh, there's, a, there's a timer. Um, lights are back on at least for the moment. Uh, all right, next question. Um, Kevin, looks like uh, this is a question from Facebook. Thank you, Robert. Um, why can't the wolf recovery objectives be managed by regional area like other wildlife species? Yeah, if I remember that, uh, what what's going on with that is that that's our own um, state uh, endangered species uh, legislation. And it doesn't leave room for regional delisting of, of any species. And wolves are under the, and that listing is under that same rule. It is something, uh, there's, a, there's the wolf advisory group that's been around since, you know, we've been working on wolves for a long time. And that is a question that has come up through that group numerous times. So it would require a change in state law in order to do that. Thanks, Kevin. Um, also, sticking with folks on Facebook, uh, uh, Dave would like to know, and, and, and maybe um, some additional comment about the Blue Mountain Elk situation, but he would like to know what's going on with the population decline in the Southeast Washington elk herd. Yeah, Steve, I think that you covered, you covered that uh, pretty well in the summary of the elk assessment. Um, what, I, what I think maybe might help Dave is if he got a chance to go look at that document on the commission website, he could pull that up if he refers to the December 2nd meeting, he can find that in the agenda and, and that's where that's posted at. And that'd be some good reading for him, I think. Great, thank you, Kevin. And then it looks like we had several people and I'm, I'm um, trying to get to kind of the core of the question here. Several people on Facebook asked about the availability of branched antler elk tags in Eastern Washington. Um, could you share more about hunting opportunity for bull elk? Um, so again, wasn't specific to a particular herd area. Um, uh, not, not quite clear on that question. Um, Maybe suffice it to say, Steve, if people don't know, um, so in some parts of Eastern Washington, we manage the branch bull opportunity through a permit system. And in those same areas, it's spike only hunting or it's um, true spike if you're over in region three. And then in um, other parts of our region, like the northern two thirds, that's all just general general season elk hunting where uh, uh, branch bulls are available, just like a, a spike bull. I, I, I'm not quite sure what the, what the question actually is. Great. All right, appreciate that, Kevin. All right, let's see if we can get a few more here. Um, all right. Uh, why are there no pheasant release sites in Spokane County, Kevin? Well, there's a pheasant release site at Fish Trap and the other one, and well, yeah, there's one at Fish Trap, and then a whole bunch in Whitman County and uh, the one up at Sherman Creek. A lot of it has to do with, we only get so many pheasants per year and the other piece is, uh, where are we gonna do the releases at? It's gotta be a site that's suitable 
um, that people can get on. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see, back to Facebook. Why was there a reduction in the number of antlerless whitetail tags in the Spokane unit? Yeah, I think you mentioned that briefly. There's a, we had a big uh, EHC blue tongue outbreak in 15 and 16. Um, the local district bio was kind of hoping that herd would recover on its own. And then just this last year, boy, it just didn't look like it was coming along. So we did that reduction and it was a good thing we did uh, because we got hit with another EHD blue tongue outbreak. All right. Uh, let's see from Facebook. Uh, Aaron would like to know why the forest grouse hunting opener was pushed back from September 1 to September 15th. Yeah, that uh, that was due to trying to protect broods. And so when we gave the four grouse, when we upped it from three grouse to four grouse, um, we thought there may be an additional impact in that early part of the season. That's something that our uh, bios that work in grouse areas and our statewide grouse people have been worried about for a long time. And so that's all about protecting broods and hens. Okay. Uh, really interesting question. This one might, this one might challenge you a little bit, Kevin, we may need to have this person touch base with you, but, but, uh, what can be done if anything to protect great gray owls in the blue mountains? The amount of photographers are pushing the limits that I have seen some camped out directly under a nest. Uh, the male appeared to be reluctant to feed the female due to the presence of humans. It's getting out of hand. Yeah, there's unethical folks out there that are <laughs> that do stuff like that. I think on that one, it kind of depends on who the underlying land manager is. So if this activity is taking place on our land, then uh, we'd ask these folks to let us know about it and we could get the district bio and enforcement involved. Um, and then if it's on the forest service, I'm sure they're very interested in, in great gray owls being harassed. So that's where I would point those, the question. All right. So I see that we're, uh, we're at our time limit. We're going to take, uh, we're going to take one more question, uh, knowing that we've got a number here that we will need to be uh, getting back to people on. Uh, but looks like the final question, uh, is going to be associated with the predator prey project. Uh, so Kevin, um, why were bears not included in the predator prey project? Um, I think that is just the, the sweetest species that, um, the university and that our department scientists wanted to work at under the under the guise of predator prey were had been selected um that doesn't mean we're not doing work on black bear um in fact we wrapped up a uh uh a black bear hair snare study in um, district one uh two years ago and that's where you're using the dna from uh hair hair snare stations to do a population estimate on black bear so we are doing other black bear work and research that just isn't under the guise of predator prey. And some of it is actually in the same area. Great. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Uh, well, I, I do want to take the opportunity, first of all, to thank everyone for participating tonight. Um, you know, I, I, I would much prefer to be in the, the large uh, conference center with the cup of coffee and the cookies in the back afterward and an opportunity to, to visit with uh, all of you that would would attend, um, but we're not able to do that yet. Um, I hope that this worked well for people, or at least um, worked as well as possible. Um, really appreciate your participation. Um, questions were great, um, and look forward to continued opportunities to engage with you. Um, I do want to make sure that uh, you know again that you can reach out to us um, through our customer service staff throughout the course of the year. Again, you've got multiple emails, um, including the team Spokane at dfw.wa.gov. You also have the director at dfw.wa.gov. Um, and with that, Kelly, I'd just ask if there's any final thoughts. Well, same as you, Steve. I want to uh, thank people for taking their time out of their busy schedules to join us tonight. I think we had some great questions, felt good engagement, uh, and we will get answers to the questions that we didn't get to and try to get them directly to you. And uh, don't hesitate, send those questions in at any time. We, we pride ourselves on getting answers back on those questions. Other than that, thanks to the team. 
for hanging out tonight and thanks to the crowd for being here and look forward to when we are actually standing with you next time oh, hopefully next time we'll see how the greek alphabet continues exactly all right thanks everyone really appreciate it have a good night i know <laughs>